Welcome everyone to the 2023 Photonic Spectra Conference. Thank you for joining us. And in this session, you'll hear from Rez Mani, an application scientist at Allied Scientific Pro. Rez earned a doctorate in Earth and Space Science with a focus on satellite optical instrumentation. He joined ASP in 2018 and is a voting member of the Color Committee of the Illumination Engineering Society. Today, he is joining us to discuss handheld digital light spectral photometers. If you have any questions or comments, you can type them right into the conference chat box on your screen. And if you missed part of today's session, you can always come back later and watch it on demand. If you have any sort of technical issues throughout the event, please log out and back in to rejoin the session. Rez, we appreciate you for taking the time to present here at the 2023 Photonics Spectra Conference. Thank you very much, Jacob, for your introduction. Uh, and uh, I thank the Photonics Spectra for giving me the opportunity to present my work today. So I'm going to maximize this. Okay, so my name is Rez Manny, and I work for the company Allied Scientific Pro. Um, the title of my talk today is Handheld Digital Light Processing, DLP, Spectrophotometers, Their Benefits and Limitations. So before we get into the, uh, the DLP, Spectrophotometers, what they are, uh, I just want to talk a little bit about a uh, comparison between near-IR and mid-IR. So you can see the near-IR region here in the 780 to 2500 nanometer. Uh, and right next to the visible and on the right side is a mid-infrared. So when you work in the mid-infrared, there are certain limitations. For example, the equipment are expensive. The samples need to be uh, prepared beforehand. Uh, the water absorption swamps uh, a lot of signals. So the watery samples are hard to measure. And um, it's just a slow process to do NIR measurements. So the, sorry, to, to do the mid-IR measurements. For NIR measurements, uh, it's a fast, uh, non-invasive process that doesn't require sample preparation. And um, it's easier to use it. Uh, it can be used for identifying and sorting of different material and also for process monitoring. But the downside is you need to analyze the spectra more in detail as, as compared to the mid-IR. So now we can talk directly about the difference between the digital light processing DLP versus linear array uh, spectrometers. So on the left side, you see a typical spectrophotometer that uses linear array. So there are two lamps shine on the sample and the, the diffuse reflectance is collected by the lens, shines on the grating, collimated shines on the grating, and different elements are detected by different pixels. Uh, so this is how traditionally it's done. But for DLP spectrophotometers shown on the right figure, uh, the detector array has been replaced by a micromirror array. So you can see everything else is the same, but instead of having a detector array, there's a micromirror mirror array, and uh, the, multi, the linear array has been replaced by a single point detector. So here you can see these mirrors turn one at a time towards the single element detector. At the picture right now, the green is turning towards it and then it turns away. Next is yellow, turns towards it and turns away. And bit by bit, the spectrum is built. So this is the main difference in the functionality. So this brings about certain advantages and certain disadvantages for the uh, DL, for DLP. And let's talk about the advantages first. Uh, first of all, because the cost of the uh, micromere array is less than the uh, detector array, it will reduce the cost of the spectrometer. So you can see the DLP spectrophotometers are significantly less expensive because the parts are less expensive. Uh, secondly, uh, because uh, a single point detector is used instead of an, an uh, array detector, you can increase the size and this would increase the signal to noise ratio. Uh, and also uh, there is a high resolution DMD board 
which in one case could be 854 by 480. This would allow uh, custom patterns to, to optimize what you want to do. So if you don't want to uh, basically scan all the regions, you're only interested in certain regions of the spectrum, you can program it so that only certain regions are scanned. So this program about program, the ability to program uh, is, is an advantage for DM, DMD, for DLP spectrum photometers. Now let's talk about the limitations. And uh, for this uh, first limitation, I'm trying to show a video. And this video is uh, uh, a, a detector array spectrometer is pointing towards the fluorescent lamp and would instantaneously detect the spectrum. So let's take a look at it. So it's just as soon as it points towards the, the fluorescent lamp, it detects the mercury lines. So the detection is instantaneous, and this is a this is a good uh, advantage for linear array. In case of uh, DLP, this detection is not instantaneous because you're going bit by bit, so you get a final image, a final snapshot of the spectrum. So this is one limitation. The second limitation is that uh, in case of detector array, you can do multiplexing, you can do boxcar averaging between different pixels, but in case of DLP, you have only one uh, array element. So you, you have only one element detector, sorry, in gas element detector, and you can't do the boxcar or multiplexing. Uh, the other difference is uh, for small signals, the array detectors uh, can uh, basically you can increase the integration time and amplify the small signal, but in case of DLP there is no ampli there is no uh, integration time. There is only exposure time. So increasing the exposure time does not increase the amplitude of the signal. It will just do more. Uh, it has more time to do um, averaging, so it could help the signal to noise reduce the noise, but it doesn't amplify the signal. So these are some of the limitations. Uh, so this is a quick diagram of the uh, uh, one typical spectrophotometer called NervaScan that uses a DMD board. And you can see there is a, a long pass filter at 885 nanometer because the range is 900 to 1700, the diffraction grading, DMD board, and the single element detector. I'm not spending too much time on this, just a brief look at it. Uh, there are different models for spectrophotometers. And for example, in case of a nervous scan, you have a ref diffuse reflectance that model that is used for solids and powders. You have a transmittance model with a cuvette that is used for liquids. And there's a fiber model that doesn't have any internal lights. And you can use that in an external lamp. I'll show you that later in a later slide. Uh, the standard range is 900 to 1700 nanometers, and uh, and uh, uh, basically the optical resolution is 10 nanometer, but you get a five nanometer interval in your in your data. Here's also another range, 1350 to 2150 nanometers. This is called the extend sorry, extended range. And uh, basically, uh, because you're using an extended in-gas detector and you may need to do some cooling also, some fans and uh, you know cooling devices may be required. This is more expensive than the standard range, but, uh, and the standard spectrometer. So this uh, has a resolution of 12 nanometer and you get the data increment at six nanometers. So in this slide, I'm showing the um, absorption diagram basically for near IR. And you can see you can have combination bands and first overtone, second overtone, third overtone. And the signal strength basically decreases as you go from first overtone to second to third. And I've pointed out here where the standard range is for the NERVASCAN instrument, which is a typical spectrophotometer uh, with DLP technology. And uh, that is 
covering mostly the second overtone region. The extended is covering mostly the first overtone region, so the signal strength is higher. Uh, and there are certain bands, for example, this phosphorus band here can only be detected in the first in overtone and using the extended, it doesn't exist in the second overtone region. But, you know, getting more signal, you have to pay more for the instrument because the, the parts are more expensive. There's a trade-off there. Uh, here are some uh, typical applications. Uh, this was a case study with several um, samples of uh, uh, fabric, and the contact who sent this fabric said one of them uh, has an extra element. So see if you can detect that with the nervous scan. So we did the scanning, and it turned out that sample number seven had an extra peak here at around 1,100 nanometers. So you can qualitatively analyze the spectra without doing any uh, deep chemometrics analysis also. It actually turns out that this extra peak is due to an aromatic ingredient, toluene. So qualitative uh, analysis is also possible. As far as the software is concerned for uh, nervous scan, there is uh, the PC software or GUI, and you can see it over here. You have uh, different plots, reflectance, absorbance, intensity. So you can also define different scan configurations. There are some existing ones, Column 1 and Hadamard are there already, but you can define your own scan configuration if you like. And you can also uh, record your own reference. Uh, here, if you put it on scan setting, uh, you can, this scan tab would turn into a uh, reference, and then this would be on new. You could put this on new, uh, so you can record your own reference from a spectral on surface, for example. Once that's done, then the reference turns into scan, and then you can go ahead and uh, measure your spectra. If you're changing parameters, uh, it's always recommended to, to record a new uh, reference. You can also use the app to communicate with the device via Bluetooth, that's shown over there. Here's a quick comparison of the uh, Hadamard and column. In case of column, only one of the mirrors in each column is turned toward the detector, as you can see here. But in case of Hadamard, uh, you have more than one mirror turns turning towards the detector. So the Hadamard will have a higher throughput and would help the signal to noise ratio improvement. Here's uh, the transmittance uh, unit, uh, one case study where a contact sent uh, uh, some basically liquid samples, detergents, and we measured it uh, over the full range successfully. We always uh, recommend to use uh, glass cuvettes because as you can see here, the plastic cuvettes have some absorption features, which we don't want to uh, introduce in the measurement. And if you happen to have a, a plastic cuvette, then your reference should be from an empty plastic cuvette. But in general, it's always better to use a glass cuvette. This is another example of a, a pharmaceutical uh, liquid that is used in medical imaging, and it has a mixture of several different compounds here cryptofix, ethanol, and acet acetonitrile. And uh, our contact wanted to see if the right mixtures are in there. So we measured it with the uh, transmittance units. And we found that the one centimeter long cuvette is too long. And there's no uh, absorption signal past 1379 nanometers. So the, the signal is swamped. So because we didn't have access to a uh, thinner um, uh, cuvette, we cut this one centimeter into two parts from the middle and then we shaved off some of the sides and put it back to front to make a narrow three millimeter cuvette. Once we repeated the experiment with this, we saw there are some signals appearing uh, past uh, 1400 nanometers. So 
this shows that the size of the cuvette or the thickness of the cuvette is important for different applications. Similar results for uh, crude oil. Uh, it was provided by contact with a one millimeter cuvette. And then there was uh, some measurement. We found that the more viscous samples had a very sharp slope at the beginning. So there was a correlation between the sharp slope, steep slope at the beginning of the spectra and viscosity of the sample. So you can also see the extended range and the standard range for this, this particular application. These are snapshots from a video that I made, a YouTube video uh, showing the operation of the fiber model with a five watt external lamp. Because as I said, the fiber model doesn't have uh, internal lamps, but you can trigger an external five watt lamp using the spectrometer. And uh, the lamp also has a collecting lens of eight millimeter focal length, and that would collect the backscattered reflection uh, focus it into the fiber optic and take it into the input slit of the spectrometer. So the measurement is done in two steps. In the first step, you would put this spectral on surface right underneath the lamp and measure the reference. And then the second step, you can put the sample underneath and the lamp comes on, measures the diffuse reflectance, and you can create the absorption spectrum of the sample. This is useful for applications where you want don't want to touch the samples. For example, if you want to have a conveyor belt and samples moving underneath. So as I said, the near IR uh, is not so simple as to analyze as mid IR. So you need to decipher the signal from all these combination bands and overtones. So you need to do proper analysis and chemometrics is, is essential for near IR. Uh, so we use different models for chemometrics for sorting applications. We use principal component analysis and linear discriminant analysis. Uh, you can see clusters are formed here for different spectra, and then you can use that to separate different uh, samples. And for quantitative evaluation, we normally use a partial least square and come up with predictions. I'll talk about some examples later. So basically, <clears throat> machine learning can also be used, uh, but mostly we use at the moment PLS and PCA LDA, but we have also have the capability to do machine learning. I'll talk about that later. <clears throat> so one of the first uh, uh, measurements that we did was uh, provided by uh, one of our contacts in France who uses, uh, uh, who is interested in measuring the bricks content of grapes that are used for wine. And uh, to get the exact measurements, they use a bricks meter, which is a refractometer, and they measure uh, using this bricks meter, the exact bricks content. But uh, the contact also had bought the spectrophotometer and measured these 52 spectra. You can say there's an, uh, there's an outlier here that we're not using. Uh, so <clears throat> looking at the spectra is always useful to make sure there are no outliers. So we actually use 52 spectra for calibration. And of course, you can you have to do some pre-processing because the spectra are offset uh, with respect to each other due to scattering of uh, the samples. So you need to get rid of this DC offset. And for this reason, we, we normally use second derivative. The second derivative would give us a peak at the same location as the original peak. But in doing the second derivative, we also introduce noise. So we use a Savitsky Golay filter with a particular window to smoothen the noise. So I did all of this uh, except for the pre processing part that was done using a Python code. Uh, I did the PLS modeling in the software Minitab, uh, that is a statistical software. And this is the Savitsky Golay second derivative. Uh, spectrum and this is our calibration curve you can see there are some points that are missing in the middle it was not the most complete uh curve uh we did the our uh, pls modeling and got an rmsc of 0.77 bricks which is not too bad considering that we didn't have a complete calibration 
curve. After doing this, uh, we built this uh, cloud platform on AWS, uh, which is all based on Python programming. And the cloud platform is available to, to those who purchase the instrument for free. And they could upload their uh, profiles, the spectral profiles. They could do the pre-processing, Savitsky Golay, second derivative, and they can do all kinds of modeling. So this cloud platform is, is very useful for uh, doing the analysis. Uh, there's also a feature there where you can choose the validation and calibration curves and basically uh, ask the cloud to get the optimized parameters and number of components for your PLS model, for example, and also the optimized number of Savitsky Gole. So here you can see the cloud is given five and 11. We are also trying to introduce the cross-validation into this cloud platform uh, where you leave one out and then you would use the rest of the calibration file to predict that one and then you move down and this way you can predict uh, all the all the values of the calibration file. But this is still uh, under uh, uh, built, so we haven't finished it yet. All right, so the next serious project that we worked on was the wheat kernels, protein, and moisture measurement. So the first question is that why do you need to measure protein from, from wheat? And this curve explains that it's because the cost of uh, wheat would go up with higher protein content. And this is what farmers are very concerned about. So our contact who is in Manitoba uh, deals with a lot of farmers and they have these expensive instrument. Our contact has this very expensive grading monochromator in instrument that uses to um, identify the protein content and, uh, and the moisture content. There are also other methods for gold standards, such as HPLC, the combustion matter method, and the gel doll method. And uh, these are all uh, can be used for gold standard for the PLS, where you, you should know what is the exact protein content. So uh, they provided us with some samples. In fact, there were 190 samples. Uh, but we only used 100 because we only did the PLS modeling over a narrowed range. We are not getting good accuracy for the full range, and I'll explain why in a future slide. So the measurement was done from different spots, and many averages were taken, and these are the calibration, validation spectra, and the Savitsky Golay that you can see here. Uh, so then the the PLS model was built in the range 14.5 to 16.5 dry matter protein, and the cloud could do predictions for a validation set. So we just got a 0.47 RMSC value for our validation. Uh, this uh, histogram shows that we don't have enough samples in, in the full range. So that's the reason why we chose 14.5 to 16.5. So our contact is trying to find more samples in other ranges so we can expand our prediction. The other uh, parameter of interest is moisture. And uh, the reason more is moisture is, is, is of interest in um, wheat is because increasing moisture and temperature would uh, increase the probability of spoilage. So for storing conditions, the, the farmers need to know the moisture content of the wheat. So we also did uh, PLS modeling with 74 calibration spectra, 18 validation. Uh, I'm not showing the pre-processing part here. Uh, again, here, this distribution of our data. And uh, we got a relatively good RMSC of 0.34. As I said, the cloud could make predictions and you can also export the predicted values uh, when you use the cloud. So uh, I, in order to find uh, a better, uh, you can say, uh, comparison, I sent our spectra to a scientist in South Africa in a university in the food 
uh, science department and they have really good modeling capabilities. So they had their own, uh, basically they had their own uh, uh, wheat samples. They did the measurement and also the modeling for their own wheat samples and they also did it for our samples, only the modeling part. And they got very good results for their own sample, something like 0.36% uh, RMSCP, uh, and also a compatible 0.37% RMSEV. But for our samples, there was a discrepancy, and we couldn't, they couldn't get the really good results. And they have questioned some of our measurements. So we're trying to repeat the measurements. The other thing they did was uh, they tried to uh, predict their uh, samples or our samples with their model and they found that there's a big offset value. So this is a lesson to show that you cannot use a, a, a model built for one protein kind uh, to apply to another. But once they combined it, then they got a very good uh, uh, accuracy for prediction. So combination works, but separately, they can't uh, predict one model, one wheat uh, species with the model for the other one. Next is uh, plastic sorting. Uh, we are talking about plastic sorting uh, using the spectrophotometer. Uh, in a typical uh, sorting facility, we have uh, uh, the workers are separating these manually. But near IR could help to separate these uh, using the spectra. So we typically use LDA models and form different clusters. Uh, LDA works better than PCA. And then we can define certain regions around these clusters. So once you test a sample shown by these black squares, then we know is it closer to which cluster? And if it fits into any of these circles, then we identify it as that particular plastic. So here is another video, and I took some snapshots of this video. I tested uh, five different uh, plastics, and this communicates with the cloud. Uh, so it sends the spectra to the cloud. The cloud runs the, the LDA model, identifies the plastic type, and sends the result back. And the accuracy of this was 100%. So it was, uh, it was very successful. Excuse me. Uh, this also was used for material identification. In case of test floor, uh, similar models were uh, built for wooden surfaces, hard wood surfaces, and also for carpets. So this is all has applications for identifying different materials uh, on the surface and they have also used machine learning algorithm to identify different surfaces. Our cloud is capable of doing that. So this is an example where a residual network, neural network machine learning algorithm was used to identify a hardwood surface. Uh, the last application is uh, using nervous scan or a spectrophotometer to identify diseases. And uh, for example, Zika virus, you can do measurements from the uh, from the belly and head of a Zika uh, of a mosquito to find uh, whether this virus is there or is not there. And the paper was published uh, by these authors. I'm quoting it in here, and uh, <clears throat> they've been very successful in modeling and distinguishing between different types of mosquitoes uh, or the mosquitoes that were carrying the virus and the mosquitoes that did not carry the virus. One of the authors also contacted us, Maggie Lord, to uh, ask us if we could use this for identification of uh, malaria. So they have um, they have been using this spectrophotometer to find uh, basically this uh, parasite uh, of malaria from the patients by taking measurements from their uh, finger, from their uh, ear, and from their arm. And this is an ongoing work that is going on and we're supporting them. So hopefully this would be a, a novel method of um, identifying malaria in patients. So that brings us to the end of our talk and the conclusion 
uh, we already talked about use of DLP spectrophotometers and uh, how they're different from linear array technology. Uh, we showed different models of DLP spectrophotometers, the transmittance, the reflectance, and the uh, fiber model. Uh, so we showed that these spectrophotometers could be used for food processing, material ID, plastic recycling, and disease detection, such as malaria. Uh, we discussed the chemometrics, the PLS modeling, and LDA modeling uh, for, for quantification and sorting. And we also uh, looked at some of the limitations of these devices. So with this, I thank you for your attention. And if there are any questions, please feel free to ask. Thank you, Rez, for sharing a lot of your work with spectrophotometers. We're a little tight on time here, but I would like to remind everyone on the audience that if you haven't already, you can type your questions and comments into the conference chat box. And don't worry, if you haven't been answered yet, you will be at a later date. This session is hosted by us at Photonics Media, and we're certainly hoping you're enjoying the 2023 Photonics Spectra Conference. Lastly, Thank you again, Resmani, for presenting the benefits and limitations of handheld digital light processing spectrophotometers. Thank you, Jacob. It was a pleasure.